Now, before we really go into detail, I would like to talk about some very important clinical relevance with these coverings. Have you heard of the terms called epidural hemorrhage? Yes. Epidural hemorrhage. Then there is another term which is called, yes, subdural hemorrhage. Then there is another term which is used for, yes, another hemorrhage. We have to talk about these all hemorrhages, epidural, subdural, then there is subarachnoid hemorrhage, arachnoid hemorrhage, and then there is intracerebral hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage. Before I really go into detail, I would like my students should be very, very crystal clear about these different type of hemorrhages because these different four types of hemorrhages are at different locations, in different spaces, and different places, and clinically, they have different causes and different consequences, right? First of all, we will talk about epidural hemorrhage. Where the epidural hemorrhage occur? Epidural hemorrhages or epidural hematoma or epidural bleeding is in epidural space. Now we have to see what is the epidural space? Where is the epidural space? So who will tell me where is epidural space? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are talking about epidural hemorrhages in epidural space. So who knows where is exactly in this diagram epidural space? Anyone? Is there nothing in? Yeah. Excellent, very good. Let me tell you what he is saying. Let's make a more simple diagram. That this is your skull bone. Right? This is skull bone. It's a very simple diagram. And here is your, what is this? Dura matter. Right? Dura matter basically has two layers when we talk about in relation to the skull. Dura matter has two layers. One layer is very much attached with the bone. Right? This is the layer of the dura matter which is very much, I must draw, that it is sticky with the bone. And this layer which is sticking with the bone, this is called periosteal layer of the dura matter. This is periosteal layer of the dura matter. Then dura matter has one more layer which is called meningeal layer. The second is called, this is meningeal layer and this is periosteal layer. Now this is the meningeal layer of dura matter, right? At some places it becomes separated from the periosteal layer and make a space. There is a space here. At some places, naturally, physiologically, these two layers separate and they make a space. And in this space, this space is lined by endothelial. Yes, what is it? Endothelial cells. And this endothelial cells lined space is meant for a very special purpose. Through this space, venous blood is running, right? Again, let me repeat. This is meningeal layer, this is periosteal. And at some places, meningeal and periosteal separate. And the channel is made, and through this channel, blood is running, physiologically. This space is called, this through which the blood is running, this is called dural sinus. That within the dura matter, there is a sinus through which the blood is running, so we call it venous dural sinuses. What we call them? Venous dural sinuses. These are natural. I will teach you those things later in tomorrow's lecture. Venous dural sinuses. But usually, at other places, these two layers are very close to each other. This layer and the other layer. 
meningeal layer and periosteal layer are very very close to each other they are almost attached sticking to each other but by some pathological process we can separate it and create a space again listen these two layers are very very close except at what is this venous dural sinuses right they are very close right but sometimes they can be separated because normally physiologically space is not there we say that there is no actual space there is potential space when there are two layers in the body there are any two layers in the body they are sticking with each other right but with some pathological process we can create a space but normally there is no space we say there is no actual space there is only potential, potential space mm -hmm. so between these two layers of the dura mater actually normally there is potential. potential space when we talk about the skull and relationship of dura mater am i clear now but a very important vessels run through this area very important blood vessels run through this area who will tell me the blood vessels which run at this point okay let me make a more clear diagram so that you remember those vessels that there are some blood vessels which run at this area of course there is artery and there is a vein along with it yeah meningeal arteries and veins excellent who said it good good irene good so meningeal arteries and meningeal veins which supply the blood to the skull bone as well as mainly to meninges meningeal arteries and veins run between the skull bone and what is this layer meningeal layer or you can say meningeal arteries and meningeal veins run between the what is this periosteal and meningeal dura mater some people assume periosteal layer should be taken as skull part right so this is the meningeal layer of dura mater now these meningeal vessels exactly where they run let me explain let's see who recognizes these landmarks first of all here is your nose i hope you understand what are these and like me a little bit here now don't laugh at your teacher right i have do have some here now listen now what is happening anterior cranial fossa middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa of course you must be knowing at least this foramen what is this foramen magnum thanks for knowing it okay this is of course what is that cella trachea pituitary gland sit over here like this yeah now this is middle cranial fossa from here through foramen spinosum meningeal middle meningeal artery comes out and it gives an anterior branch which runs like this and posterior branches now this artery is running in a groove between this is the bone and this is the dura mater or to be very accurate this artery is running between two layers of the dura mater be very accurate and this space this is the artery running am i clear now this artery is exactly running at this space this is a branch of anterior branch of middle meningeal artery this is very important branch why because if you hit someone at temple if you hit someone at temple the bones here are very weak there is squamous part of temporal bone and there is squamous part of parietal bone and these bones here are very very weak and under this area there are meningeal arteries vessels and if you get an injury here if this bones are fractured right and within the bony groove these vessels are running these vessels are ruptured or lacerated and a bleeding start and this bleeding or blood which leaks out it accumulates between the skull and the dura mater right so what really happens if this vessel rupture yes what will happen hematoma will go like this all this blood is what is this 
hemorrhage, blood is accumulating here. Right? Now, this is out of meningeal layer. Right? So, we call it hemorrhages within the epidural space. Please don't confuse this hemorrhage with the hemorrhage later on I will explain which occurs at this point. Hemorrhage at this point number one this is epidural hemorrhage. Right? Later on I will explain that here is what? What is this? Arachnoid. Right? And hemorrhage can occur between du uh, dura and arachnoid at this point. That is a different hemorrhage entirely with different causes, with different consequences, right? So right now we are concentrating only in epidural hemorrhage. Some authors call epidural hemorrhage as extradural hemorrhage also. Because they say the truly dura matter is a membranous layer, right? So this hemorrhage, right, this one, this is epidural as well as it can be considered, yes, extra, extra dural hemorrhage. Now if someone asks you that what are the causes of this type of hemorrhage, you can say trauma to the skull, injury to the skull, most commonly on the temple, temple right? Especially when it involves the ruptures or bleeding from the, which arteries? Anterior, Anterior branch of middle meningeal artery and vein. Am I clear? Really? Now. Very special point about this epidural hemorrhage is you know the cause, right? You know the vessel which is involved. Now a little bit clinical. So what is the very special thing about this? Which really if you, as a doctor you know that, you can save lives. The special thing is something called lucid interval in the clinical picture. Let me tell you what is lucid interval. Usually what happens, person gets the injury, is that right? He gets the injury and if he becomes unconscious, if a person gets injury and injury and he gets unconscious, if there is no bleeding, he should recover rapidly. Is that right? Listen now carefully. If someone gets a head injury here, number one, he should not be unconscious. Number two, if he becomes unconscious and there is no hemorrhage within the brain, if he is unconscious due to contusional injury to the brain substance, he should recover very rapidly. But a person who has hemorrhage like this, his clinical picture is different. Either he becomes unconscious due to initial injury and then recovers. After the recovery, he again gradually starts falling into deeper level of lower conscious level. You have to remember this. That initial injury, if it produces unconsciousness, normally should recover rapidly. Or it may not produce unconsciousness. Right? But if there is epidural hemorrhage, then gradually over the hours, or days, or even weeks, patient progressively goes into deeper and deeper level of falling, levels of conscious unconsciousness. Right? So we can say this interval between that initial event and later on development of the drowsiness and unconsciousness, this time interval is called lucid interval. What is it called? Lucid interval. It is very, very typical of epidural hemorrhage. It's very, very typical of epidural hemorrhage that for example person is brought to the hospital and he is progressively going into deeper levels of coma and there is some history of head injury right and people who, who bring him they may narrate that after the head injury he initially he did not lose the consciousness and after a few hours or days he started or they say initially he lost the conscious level he recovered and then later on he started losing it. Am I clear to everyone? No problem here? Another important point about this type of hemorrhage is, of course I'm teaching doctors, that point is important. All of you are going to be doctor, am I right? Yes. Right. Another very important point is, when you suspect some problem like this, immediately do the CT scan. 
right? On CT scan, if this hemorrhage is there, there will be, you know, hematoma visible. The blood is very, very dense. It makes dense image, darker image than the brain substance, right? But this image is very special configuration of this image, of this hematoma, which helps you to differentiate this hematoma from other hematomas. What is special thing about this hematoma image? The special thing is that dura matter is attaching with the skull tightly. Because dura matter is normally attaching with the skull tightly when once bleeding occurs between the skull and the dura matter, do you think blood will easily spread or it has to produce ten tension? It will produce tension, right? So it will start producing tension and making a very important hematoma which forcefully separates the dura matter from the skull. But as dura matter is stripped away, a point will come where dura matter is attached with the suture of the, suppose these are the skull bones. And you know in between the skull bones there are, what is there? Sutural ligaments. Sutural ligaments. At the sutural ligaments, dura matter is tightly held. At the sutural ligaments, dura matter is tightly sticking with the skull. So blood cannot escape into that direction. Then as blood is tracking down here, maybe this is another sutural, another bone, and in between the bone there is suture, and this is another sutural ligament. So again, this is very tightly held here. So what really happens, that dura matter will be stripped like this, right? But dura matter cannot be lifted from this sutural point, attachment point and dura matter cannot be lifted away from this point. So what really happens that the shape of this hematoma is now you see like that. It is like a lens. This shape is like a lens. On one side there is bone, other side there are dural attachment. So this is very very diagnostic point that if you suspect hemorrhage in the cranial cavity and you take MRI or you do the CT scan and on that you find the hematoma is making lens shape, lens shape or biconvex arrangement, right? Or hematoma is specially abruptly blocked by sutural points, you must think this is what kind of hematoma or what, what type of hemorrhage? Epidural. Epidural hemorrhage. I hope you will remember that. And treatment is not that difficult if you diagnose it right, transfer it to the neurosurgeons and usually they produce a burr hole here and evacuate the clot. Any question up to this? No. So this is epidural hemorrhage. Again, epidural space in the cranial cavity, is it a real space or <coughs> potential space? Potential. potential space. Is that right? And which arteries bleed there? Meningeal, Meningeal arteries and veins. Is that clear? Right.